Hello friends, welcome to Autumn at St. Andrew. It is my privilege to welcome you here today from the beautiful St. Andrew Sanctuary. I am grateful as always to share this sacred online space with you, where we are all invited, included, and valued as vital and beloved members of our broader worshiping community. St. Andrew is proud to be an open, affirming, inclusive congregation that welcomes all people into the full life and communion of our church. This includes saints and sinners, believers and skeptics, the lost and the found, the wanderers and the wanderers, families of all shapes and sizes, and people from every point along life's journey. No matter who you are or where you've been, no matter what you believe or even if you believe anything at all, you are welcome here and you belong here. If you have any questions about our church, prayer requests for our care team, or if you would like to get in touch with a member of our pastoral team or staff, please email info at gosaintandrew.com. If you would like to explore deeper engagement with the St. Andrew community through our many classes, group life gatherings, and service opportunities, you can email us directly at connect at gosaintandrew.com. We would love to hear from you. Just as a reminder, our full Sunday morning worship services, complete with music, prayer, announcements, liturgy, ministry spotlights, and the sermon, are live streamed on our YouTube page each week and permanently archived for viewing anytime. Lastly, to contribute a financial gift to the work and ministry of St. Andrew, you can always visit gostandrew.com slash give or text St. Andrew to 28950. And now let's listen together to this week's scripture and sermon. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. When you pause long enough to consider your life, to reflect on where you are at this moment in your life and how far you've come over the years, how you got to where you are now and all the people who helped you get there, and then all the unexpected, undeserved, inexplicable breaks and serendipities, big and small, that lined up and fell into place one after another, all to get you to this moment. When you take all of that in, and you add it all up, and you connect all the dots, and you see how it's all somehow converged to make you who you are and to bring you here to this moment, here and now. Would you say that considering all that in some way, that you've been blessed, that your life has been blessed. Considering all that could have gone wrong but didn't, and all that went right that might not have, and all the not so great things that happened that in the end somehow made it possible for something better to happen, considering all of that, would you call yourself blessed? All right, maybe blessed isn't the, the word that you would choose. Maybe blessed sounds uh, too Christian-y or churchy or cl cliche. But we have often use this word blessed to describe our life circumstances. So we'll say things like, 
I'm blessed with excellent health. Or I've been blessed with a wonderful family. Or I'm blessed with a great job or amazing looks or six-pack abs or a great poker hand. What we often mean by blessed is good fortune. When life is good and things are going well and our cup is overflowing and we feel contentment, it might feel like our lives have been blessed. And some might even say, blessed by God. Now, it's wise to use that phrase carefully. We can too eagerly associate blessings with God's reward for doing or being good. And when the blessings aren't coming, we can too easily assume that God is punishing us for not doing or being good. Sometimes we get a little too transactional when we talk about divine blessings, but still, to believe that God wills what's best for us and offers to us in every moment goodness and favor and grace, to experience that is something like what it means to be blessed. So what about you? Would you say you've been blessed? We've all heard the timeless advice to count your blessings. It probably sounds like something your grandma would say because it's so very wise. Count your blessings. This wisdom has come down from the ancient Jewish sages from thousands of years ago who taught that we should actually aim to count at least a hundred blessings a day. Could you do that? From the moment you awaken to the moment you fall asleep, could you count a hundred good things in your day? A bowl of Captain Crunch? An encouraging text from a friend, a deep belly laugh, a, a green light when you're running late, an autumn breeze, a breathtaking sunset, an evening walk? Did you know that Jews have several different traditional prayers that they'll recite to give thanks for the various blessings they experience throughout the day. They're not just prayers around mealtimes either. Jews actually have a, a prayer called the Asher Yatzar that they'll recite after a successful trip to the bathroom, which in my opinion is spot on. I mean, have you ever sat through a three and a half hour movie at the theater trying to hold it the entire time and then experience the deep satisfaction, the pure elation of a desperately needed bathroom break. It's spiritual, magical, transcendent. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So when your spouse knocks on the door to see if you're okay in there, you now have great excuse. You can say, I'm just counting my blessings. The Jews remind us that when even our bodies are functioning correctly, we should count it a blessing. And the whole point of counting a hundred blessings a day is to focus as much as possible on all the things that are going right in our lives and in the world. And when we do that, we discover gratitude and we acknowledge God's goodness in our lives. In a world in which so much seems not to be going right, Whenever we count our blessings, we discover happiness. But we also discover something else, something even more important, something deeply subversive, in fact, something wonderfully revolutionary, especially in a world that mostly only sees the big stuff as blessings and usually fails to see how the small things possess the greatest power to make a difference. We find it here in this story from John's Gospel about the day a large crowd of people followed Jesus across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had been doing some pretty amazing things, like healing very sick and disabled people. He'd also been doing some very controversial things, like healing very sick and disabled people on the Sabbath, which was a clear violation of Hebrew law. But Jesus always prioritized love over the law and always prioritized relationships over rules. So Jesus didn't see a problem with healing people on the Sabbath. In fact, the legal violation for Jesus became a moral obligation. But this, of course, got him into so much trouble. 
trouble with the religious establishment. In fact, that when we meet up with Jesus today in the story, he's been now deemed a threat to the establishment. And that establishment now wants him dead. So Jesus says to his friends, I need to get away from people, from toxic religion, from all this hate. And he tries to take a breather with those close friends on the other side of the lake, only to be followed by 5,000 berry white types who just can't get enough of his love. And when he sits down on this hillside to rest in the story, he looks up and sees all these people marching up the lakeshore toward him. Some are sick. Some are curious. Some are probably those who want him dead. But all of them have one thing in common. <laughs> they all forgot to pack their picnic baskets. And now it's late and they're hungry and there is no food. And so Jesus asks his disciples if there's anything for these people to eat. But Philip replies, uh, Jesus, uh, the door dash doesn't actually deliver for 5,000 people. And besides, he says, it'd take half a year's wages to feed all these people. And that's when Andrew speaks up and says, you know, um, there's this kid here who has five barley loaves and two salted fish in his lunchbox. Uh, unfortunately, that wouldn't be enough. What happens next here is, is a mystery. It's long been believed that, that Jesus performs a, a miracle here by multiplying that kid's loaves and fishes. But did you notice in the story that it doesn't actually say that? There's no description of some abracadabra moment or some divine hocus pocus that simply multiplies everything. I do believe Jesus performed many miracles in the Gospels. I believe he possessed the power to pull off a lot of extraordinary things. But just read this story carefully. Because all it says is that Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and distributed it to the people as much as they wanted. And then after everyone had eaten, there was so much that there was enough to, to fill 12 baskets of leftovers. It's considered a miracle story, and it's the one miracle story that actually appears in all four Gospels, the only one. Over the centuries, this story became so central to the person and ministry of Jesus and to the mission of the early church that those earliest Christians would read this story every time they gathered to celebrate the Eucharist, what we call Holy Communion. Every time. Whenever they broke the bread and passed that cup, someone would say, let's tell the story again about the day Jesus fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish. Why has this story become so important to the Christian community of the centuries? Maybe it's because it reminds us how we humans so often operate out of a sense of scarcity. Like those disciples, we, we look at all the human needs before us and all the people who in some form are starving for food, for love, for grace. And we assess the need according to our own meager resources only to come to the logical conclusion that we simply don't have enough. And just when we are satisfied with our excuse for not doing anything, does a child with five barley loaves and two salted fish step forward and say, I don't know if it'll make any difference, but here, use this. In the story, Jesus seems to be the hero, but don't you really want to be that kid? to live in such a way that you actually believe that just five loaves and two fish in the hands of God can feed the whole world. Instead, we're more like the disciples on most days who only see what they do not have and figure there's just not enough to make a difference. Parker Palmer 
a Quaker theologian and author, tells this story about being on a flight from O'Hare to Denver. The plane pulled away from the gate, taxied and taxied for the longest time. And you know that feeling, that sense that this plane is moving, but it's not going anywhere. And then your heart sinks as the engines suddenly wind down. The pilot spoke over the intercom. He said, I have some bad news. There's a storm front in the west. Denver is socked in and shut down. So we'll be staying on the tarmac here for a few hours. That's the bad news, he said. The really bad news is that we have no food on board. Now this was back when there was real food on planes and passengers actually ate meals while on flight. In that moment, everyone, everyone groaned. Some people got angry. But then one of the flight attendants stood up and took the mic. She said, we're really sorry, folks. We didn't plan this and we can't do anything about it. We know some of you are hungry and we're looking forward to lunch and some of you have a medical condition and really need to eat. So she said, I have an idea. We, we have a couple of empty baskets here and we're gonna pass them around. Everyone can put something in the basket. Some of you might have some peanut butter crackers or candy bars. Some have lifesavers and mints. She said, if you, if you don't have anything edible, just drop a business card or a picture of your kids or a bookmark. The thing is, she said, I, I hope everybody puts something in the basket. We'll pick up the baskets at the back of the plane and then pass them around again and everybody can take what they want. Parker said that what happened next was a miracle. The complaining and griping stopped. People started rooting through pockets and handbags, briefcases, lunches, and l luggage, uh, getting out candy and cheese and crackers, and suddenly people were laughing and talking. The flight attendant had transformed this group of anxious people, focused on their need and scarcity into a, a gracious community, sharing out of their abundance. That flight eventually did take off and land, and as Parker stepped off the plane, he said to the flight attendant, you know, there's a story in the Bible about what you just did. And she said, I know. That's why I did it. There's more to give when we give it together. There's greater impact when we give it together. The gospel story says it all started with a child and his five loaves and two fish. And it turned out to be enough. What looked like scarcity became an abundance. Maybe it was something like what happened on that airplane. Maybe the people were so inspired that by that kid that, that they all started digging through their pockets and, and sharing whatever scraps of bread that they'd been secretly hoarding. Or maybe they all put money in a basket and the disciples door dashed some Long John's fish and chips for all 5,000 people. Wouldn't any of those explanations also be miraculous? The story begs the question then, in a weary, hungry, desperate world, are we like that child inclined to share our five loaves and two fishes? As scarce as our reserves might seem, will we still choose to share what we have in generous and life-saving ways? Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says, when you're with Jesus, you are inescapably in the bread business. You need bread to share because it's the work of Jesus to feed hungry people and express compassion concretely. I think that means you know you found the right church, not because you, you find perfect people there, but because when you are there, you find ordinary people who are in the bread business. They take seriously the words of Jesus who said, when I was hungry, you fed me. And so 
They serve real meals to those who are hungry. They stock the shelves of food pantries. They offer each other the spiritual bread of prayer, presence, friendship, even casseroles. And they give their offerings too, believing that their money feeds the bodies and souls of others. In other words, they trust God enough to live not out of scarcity, this pervasive cultural fear that says there isn't enough. And instead, they live out of abundance, knowing that because they've been blessed by God, they can live with open hands, sharing what they have, confident that even five loaves and two fishes in God's hands can be multiplied. Apart from Jesus, I just think it's really hard to live like that. And Lamont once said that she'd always lived with this fantasy that if she made a certain amount of money, she'd stop worrying about money. But then she got sober and her writing career took off and she found incredible financial success. And then she said she discovered that her drug of choice was more. And she fell into this trap of wanting more money and more security as if she didn't have enough. Her Christian faith helped her overcome this trap. And she says, I know that if I feel any deprivation or fear, the solution is to give. Because giving is the way we feel abundant. Giving, she says, is the way we fill ourselves up. Maybe this is why our gospel story has endured all these years and was always read during Holy Communion. Because in the presence of Jesus, when we share our bread, it becomes the body of Christ for everyone, even us. Giving is the way we fill ourselves up. I read about this old minister from a small church in the western highlands of Scotland. His name was Johnny Dunlop. He'd served in the infantry in the British Army during World War II. He was captured and taken as a prisoner of war to a camp in Poland. The conditions were awful, cold, wet, filthy. There was just one bowl of thin soup and a scrap of bread once a day. Prisoners turned to skin and bones. Many died. The Allies were losing the war. There was little reason there for hope. Some prisoners didn't want to go on living. And one way to end it all was to throw themselves against the barbed wire fence as if trying to escape and then to be shot by the guards. And one night Dunlop was sick with despair and hunger. He slipped out of the barracks, walked toward that fence, unsure whether to end it all. As he sat down on the bare ground to think, something moved in the dark on the other side of that fence. It was a Polish farmer. He had half a potato in his hand and he thrust the potato through that barbed wire. As Dunlop took it, that man said in broken English, the body of Christ. Our takeaways for today, count your blessings to find happiness and gratitude. There's more to give when we give it together. And giving is the way we fill ourselves up.